Certain flows show a significant amount of rotation while others do not. What causes these fluids to be rotational? In this lesson, we will be learning about rotationality of fluid element. It is important to understand the conditions under which fluid flow becomes rotational. Some of the concepts outlined in this lesson were the basis for predicting lift forces on an aircraft after the first flight by Wright brothers in 1903. In those days, we did not have the computational power that we have today to solve mathematical models. Nor did we have measurement techniques to optimize aircraft wings. The physicists and mathematicians therefore relied on these techniques to come up with approximate solutions for such engineering problems. We defined vorticity as the measure of rotation of a fluid element. In the case of irrotational flows, each individual particle does not change its orientation in the flow field. In other words, these particles do not rotate as they travel through the flow field. This happens only when a fluid particle is under the influence of either body force or normal pressure force. Rotational component requires the action of shearing or shear stress. In fluid dynamics, shear is related to the rate of angular deformation. Therefore, a fluid cannot rotate without undergoing angular deformation. The relationship between shear stress and angular deformation is given by viscosity. Therefore, a flow is rotational only if it is viscous. For irrotational flows, vorticity is equal to zero. Because of this, the fluid velocity can be expressed as a function of gradient of a scalar variable called phi. This variable is defined as the velocity potential. The circulation over any closed curve or contour is defined as the line integral of the tangential component of velocity about this closed curve. For irrotational flows, circulation is also equal to zero. As a consequence, streamlines cannot form closed curves in irrotational flows. In almost all flows that occur in nature, the individual fluid elements rotate about their respective axis as they travel through the flow field. Such fluid flows are called rotational. For these flows, the vorticity vector is non-zero. In fact, from basics of vector calculus, the divergence of vorticity vector for a fully rotating flow is zero. This means that the vortex field is solenoidal. There are no sources and sinks in this vortex field. For fully rotational flows, the vorticity field lines are completely closed loops. By extension, we can say that the vorticity flux crossing any closed surface is also zero. This means the net outflow of vorticity through any closed surface is zero. Similar to the way we introduce streamlines to visualize the flow field, we can introduce vorticity lines to visualize the rotationality of the flow field. The tangent of vorticity line is parallel to the local vorticity vector. These lines can be defined by the following expression. If we consider a closed loop or curve and draw the vortex lines passing through all points on this curve, the obtained 3D shape is called a vortex tube. In fact, the flow of vorticity through any cross-sectional surface of a vortex tube is constant all along the tube. This is true at every instant of time. The integral shown here refers to the strength of the vortex or simply vortex strength. A tornado is an excellent example of a vortex tube occurring in nature. Another example is smoke ring created in air. Dolphins create vortex tube in the form of bubbles. 
If we take a linear tube and join the two ends, it would resemble a smoke ring or a bubble ring. A German physicist, Hermann von Helmholtz, came up with a series of theorems that defined the motion of a vortex tube. Pranald in 1921 made use of these mathematical theorems developed by Helmholtz to develop the classic lifting theory for line bodies such as airfoils and rings. He was able to solve the overall lift force generated on these line bodies. Helmholtz theorem states four main facts for pure rotational flows. The first one is vortex lines move with the fluid. That is, fluid elements lying on the vortex line at some instant continue to lie on that vortex line. This is valid for any ideal rotational flow. The second fact is the strength of the vortex tube is constant along its length and in time. This is true unless acted upon by dissipative forces such as viscous resistance. Smoke rings die out because of this resistive force applied by the surrounding air. The third one is that Fluid elements initially free of vortex remain free of vortex. The fluid elements which are outside these vortex tubes will remain outside. This is true unless the vortex tube is acted upon by an external disturbance. And the fourth one is vortex tubes can extend to infinity, form closed loops, similar to the case of smoke rings or, or dolphin bubble rings or end at a solid boundary. In fact, a practical example of this would be a tornado. It always attempts to touch the ground somewhere. 